how did you and, and it, well, I guess your family, you know, how did you guys get into the wine business? Uh, what my father was a civil engineer, uh -huh. and he was always interested in um, farms. He grew up in New Jersey. He and my mom met in New Jersey, and they both uh, both grew up there. And he went to school, the, you know, went to school there, and then he he uh, became an engineer after uh -huh. they were married, actually. Shortly after they were married, in um, I think it was 1950s, and um, so he was civil engineer, would uh, do big construction projects all around the world, really, and uh, he would. Um, if you want to catch you know, that? I mean, go ahead. And uh, so he wanted to, uh, um, kind of got interested in it a little bit while he was doing the heavy construction, and then um, I'm the the youngest of four kids, so they you know had a family, and then. Uh, one of the um, jobs took us to um, the Bay Area. He did. He worked. He was one of the supervisors on the underwater part of the bar, bar the tubes. Bar. Uh -huh. So we lived in Tiburon for about three years, and I was born in Tiburon in 1968. Uh -huh. So that was about the same time as when Davi was getting started up in you know, you know up in Napa. Yeah. And you know it's kind of the rebirth of the whole Napa and Sonoma Valleys were going on at that time. So he that kind of got him interested. In um, in having grapes, saying so, I mean, maybe this you know this vineyard thing could work, and so he. Um, but, they, but they didn't own this property. No, 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 uh, no. I had no idea about Southern Oregon or anything like that. Yeah. So he came up. Um, so after that job, we went back to Maryland for about six months. Um, he worked on the second Chesapeake Bay Bridge during that time, uh -huh. and um, it was. Pretty, you know, he went from one job to the other. Didn't have a vacation, and and it, it, it we had a, they had a tremendous amount of uh, labor issues there. He had to fire a bunch of people, and they were all unionized, and so there was a lot of threats against him and things like that. So he, so um, after that was done, he's like, you know, I'm taking a leave of absence. We're taking my kids. We're going to go across the country and spend some time away. Yeah. So we all packed into a trailer in 1971, and spent about two months going across country and camping and everything and we ended up in in uh on valley view road and in, in ashland uh -huh. in about this time of year september really early september of two, uh, 1971 and uh no vineyards no wineries here of course they were all wiped out by prohibition yeah. and and there was no um the reason why it, it had not taken off or it, it hadn't stayed around is because there was no monasteries there was no um there was no way to continue to produce wine. Unlike Christian Brothers and a lot of Napa Valley vineyards, they continued in production during Prohibition to make sacrificial wines where they shipped across the country because during Prohibition you could still make sacramental, sacramental wines. Yeah. So you're Not saying sacrificial that there was, wines, sacramental yeah. wines. There was no, nobody uh, but in, doing it for home. Uh, well, you could still, and you could still legally make, I believe you could still make, legally make uh, wine up to 200 gallons per year per family. Yeah. But this, but Southern Oregon had already turned its sights towards, um, you know, that the, the 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 railroad came through, went to Medford instead of Jacksonville. Everyone he went to the railroad, and they got into pears and apples and peaches and other other fruits, and kind of left grapes behind. Yeah. So when we came here in 1971, there really wasn't a whole lot. Well, there was nothing going on, so father went to the you know went to the extension service here, figured out you know, and and there was and there was very good weather records that were actually kept by Peter Britt huh. back and back up until I mean if nothing else, just high low rainfall, something written in a book, yeah. And then the National Weather Service has been here about a hundred years, yeah. So there was a relatively good track record of climate, at least high temperature, low temperature, and rainfall that we could work with. Now was that a kind of like generalized or is it like specifically to like It was the, for the it was or? for Medford. For it Medford. was for Medford and it was at the airport. Our airport's been it's been um well, let's say the airport now. It's been in that general city of Medford, let's say. Uh -huh. But you're not talking about a major difference between Medford and here. Huh. Well, you are talking about a major difference, but it's the same difference every day. That's the thing. Um, oh, Medford's yeah. generally during the summer. If it's sunny in Medford, it's going to be sunny here. Yeah. If it's raining in Medford, it's going to be raining here. 
If it's foggy in Medford, it's sunny here, but it's in the winter time. So the, the difference uh, really is the low temperatures uh -huh. are lower. Yeah. The high temperatures are lower in the summer. And that's a growing season. Of course, the summer, the, win, the winter, winter time weather here is much better here than it is in Medford, but they're dormant, so it doesn't matter. Uh -huh. Um, so it is very, there's a lot of consistency with, within that. So if you know what's going on in Medford, and you pretty much know what's going on here. I mean, I even look at the Weather Channel. I can see the Weather Channel when I go for, the, for frost protection. I go by the Medford temperature, and I just take about three or four degrees off. Cooler and here. Cooler here, yeah, because yeah. we're a little bit higher. Uh -huh. And yeah. then we have, we have uh, less asphalt. Yeah. And so, like, your dad and your mom, when they came here... They already had the vision of doing. Yeah, it was it was really my dad's vision. Uh -huh. um, it wasn't my my mom. You know, she came along with it, but uh, it uh -huh. was definitely his vision. And uh, she was she was a mom. You know, she was a mother, and she she was a great mom. But uh, it was definitely his his idea to do it. Uh -huh. And so when when we started, it was the spring of seventy two, where well, it's the fall of seventy one that we we were in. In Ashland, and we just stayed at a trailer park for a while. Yeah. Then my father would come out and look every day, talk to people. Look um, every day for some land. Look for land. Uh -huh. Talk to farmers. Talk to the historical the historical society is amazing. I mean, you can get a lot of information about about that even because it had a lot of Brits. Because Peter Britt essentially donated his entire estate to the University of Oregon. Wow. And then. Um, and then they, I think, donated to Jackson County, and somewhere along the line, a lot of that, the records and barrels and bottles all ended up at the Historical Society. So there, they, there's still, you know, records that he wrote on, you know, and bottles and all kinds of things and photos. Wow. And, of course, he was a photographer. So that was his thing. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of photography. Still shots, shots with wine, shots with grapes. There's a, there's a whole host of things that you can get there. Yeah. So that was part of his... You know, oh, there's a lot. There's this, this a gold mine of information here. Then he ended up coming out to the Applegate. Now, now he now this Peter Britt. Britt's, Yeah, Peter Britt. No, Peter Britt was in Jackson. Oh, okay. And um, I don't know if there was a lot of uh, vineyards in the Applegate. That's something that I'm not really too aware. Of, but apparently, there were some vineyards in mm -hmm. around here in the in the it, you know before before prohibition. Yeah. Um, in terms of winery, I'm not sure how much people were making wine. Maybe they were making it for their home use. Yeah. But grapes were a natural. That's the thing, kind of. I think that when people come here, even the first settlers, when Peter Brick got here within two years, there was a, you know, there was there was grapes. It seemed like, you know, when you're here for a year, you're like, hey, we should be able to grow grapes here. It's very natural to grow grapes here. Because it's of hot. the climate. Yeah, the and, climate. And, it just uh, looks like you should be able to grow grapes here. What kind of soil? You know. Generally, it's all over the map. You know, uh -huh. there's there's uh, certainly in the in the bottom parts of the Rogue Valley, there's a lot of clay, which is not the easiest thing to grow grapes on, so you avoid that. Uh -huh. If you go onto the hillsides, there's some some loamy, some sandy loam. There's gravel. Uh -huh. um, gravel from like the river. Yeah, gravel from from river beds or creek beds. You know, uh, or where where this this the this soil may be a little more shallow. Uh -huh. um, there's deep. There's deep soils, and we have like we have probably four or five different soils just in our own vineyard here. Really, I mean, we have yeah. we have a loamy soil that's right over here that's totally different than right across the road over here, which is more of a rockier. And then if you go mm -hmm. in some areas, we have a, a ribbon of clay that runs around the runs at the lower part of our vineyard, where it's where the vines really struggle, and we've kind of you know try to help them out. So. And then there's some areas that the the, the uh, it's very it's very deep, very deep soil. And so you are soils. you planting the same variety like across no. uh, like all that? Uh... Well, what we would do is um, we have gone back and, and we had the original 26 acres, um, or the original 14 acres that we planted in the spring of 1972, uh -huh. um, and we've actually changed uh, 13 of those 14 acres. We we've taken out varieties that for some reason or another we didn't we didn't care to grow or didn't grow as well here and um put in varieties that were better to grow uh -huh. and then uh, more suited to our climate and at the same time we started off with the big rows the 8 by 12 rows the big spacing uh -huh. and so and what was the thought process out, like that was your dad that uh... it's basically tractors were bigger back then uh -huh. it's as easy as that a lot of land there was a lot of land and why not fill it up 
and, yeah. and tractors were big. Now we, uh, you know, land, we, we want to get as much out of land as possible. And um, you don't have to have, you know, that much space between the vineyard. And, and other things too is, is it's, a different, it's a different method of, of pruning. Uh-huh. You know, if, if you have if you have eight feet between if you have eight feet between your, your your vines, just naturally a vine is going to grow that far and you're gonna to want to fill up that trellising, which is gonna give you a lot of fruit for one grape. Yeah. If you if you essentially make it, you know, five by nine, then you're 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 ma- you're, you're you're asking each having each uh, grape to produce less fruit. Uh-huh. And because of that, it's it's higher quality fruit, uh-huh. and and you just you can just prune differently, and also you can get more plants per acre, and most of the time you can get more tons per acre. But even if you're getting the same tons per acre, each plant is only producing five or six pounds as as opposed to sixteen pounds or twenty pounds. Yeah. So it's it's much better. You get you get much much higher quality fruit that way, yeah. and you see it in everything. Fruit trees, everything's dwarfed, you know. Fruit trees they used to have big, huge fruit trees. Now everything's smaller. Right. And we know we can go from 474, 474 plants per acre, which is the old style, to 1,200. Yeah. Or, or at nine, well, 900, even 1,200. Yeah. You know, it just depends on what your space and you want to be. And, you know, tractors are smaller. And the thing is, is that, you know, people, people may have only 10 acres. And then because of that, the need, and, and instead of the tractor dictating the space, now people are like, hey, I want it to be, well, some people up in Burgundy or even in the Willamette Valley go meter by meter spacing, right. or even, you know, really tight right. spacing. Now they're going back to the tractor manufacturer and saying, we want this space. Can you make a tractor this big? Yeah. Uh, we don't do meter by meter spacing because we don't, we don't do Pierre Noir, but, um, but and most of our varieties are relatively vigorous and they're fine with the, with, the, with the spacing that we have. But it gave us the opportunity to basically start over again. Um, but the soil question essentially is we can put, if it's in a soil that we feel that um, we need to, um, it, you know, it's most of the time you just put it in, it's fine. And soil is, I think sometimes soil is, is overrated um, in terms of quality or in terms of differences of, of areas. Um, generally speaking, you know, if, if you've got, you know, let's say, let's say some sort of a graft, I mean, 80, 90% of the time, if it's, it's in good soil, you're only going to do something if it's in soil that you feel that is going to be detrimental to your grapes. So if you're in soil that's, let's say, it's clay or heavy or, or really, uh, really vigorous, you can, you can, you can match that with a, um, a rootstock that would help it better, have it grow better. Um, but in terms of, you know, one variety being on certain soils or something like that, I mean, as long as, as, long as the soil is going to give you the, nu- the, the nutrients, as long as the grape is happy, it's not doing something weird, soil, for the most part, is overrated. Uh-huh. It's not the soil because it's the climate that's going to give you the flavors and the differences of the year to year and most of the components because if that were the case, you know, why wouldn't, you know, I mean, between Burgundy, we can't bring our soil over there. Or uh-huh. They can't bring our soil over here. So um, it's pretty much the climate is really the big thing. As, yeah. long as, the, as long as the soil is fine, then, you know, if you, and then you just take that part away. Yeah, it's growing great. We don't have any nutritional issues. Yeah. It's, it's the climate. Climate and site. And site is climate, basically. So your dad, like, what did he plant? He started with, uh, I mean, we, we, we understood it was a warmer area, maybe a cooler location in an otherwise warmer area, shorter season. Um, you know, people call this more Bordeaux-like. Yeah, it's kind of like Bordeaux, except for it's obviously warmer, it's drier, uh, a little higher in elevation. So, I mean, you start throwing those things in, then it becomes less and less like Bordeaux. Um, um, so we, we planted Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Merlot, Gamay, Pierre Noir, Chardonnay. So you planted some Pinot and, Noir. Yeah, we did plant Pinot Noir, and we uh-huh. planted a little bit of Gavirge Tomino, too. And what were the thought processes like? You know, that's quite a range. Big range, yes. Yeah. yeah you don't normally see Cabernet Sauvignon and Pinot Noir grown in the same. Yeah. It was more of a test. I mean, we had, we had obviously, a little bit, little bit less Pinot Noir, a little bit more Cabernet Sauvignon. What I, th- what I always found uh, interesting was that um, two years later, in 74, we planted additional 12 acres, or 14 acres, and we just did it in Chardonnay, Cabernet Merlot. 
So somewhere along the line, now see, I was only, I was four when we planted the first vineyard, and I was six, so I wasn't really, didn't know. You weren't a decision maker yeah. at that time. And at some point, and my dad died when I was 12, so we didn't have a whole lot of, like, um, feedback of exactly what he was thinking. Yeah. You know, we were all kids. And so uh, what, we th what, we th what I always think was interesting is, is the thought process where we hadn't even, we haven't even had grapes we two years, and then all of a sudden he knows this is, this is what we should grow. Yeah. So it worked out. It worked out really well. Um, I mean, th these are the varieties that do. They do do better than Pierre Noir. Yeah, if, if, I mean, if your heart desired to make Pierre Noir, you could find some place in the Applegate or some place up in a higher elevation where it's cooler. Uh -huh. Put bands on them. And... Whatever. Yeah. But we're not, you know, we're not Pinot people. Uh -huh. So that, you know, so we went back and we, we, we replaced all that. And then, you know, the first thing was the easy part was to replace the, the, the stuff that we didn't, you know, the gamay, the converged to or all that. Replace that with Syrah. Um, when we planted Merlot, there was only two clones of Merlot available. Oh. Now there's t a, a whole host of clones of Merlot available. So we actually would, would rip out Merlot and plant Merlot. A, a different a uh, different clone of Merlot. Yeah. Yes. On its own rootstock, or were you choosing um, rootstocks? We were choosing rootstocks by then. Um, we haven't done a whole lot. This Viognier over here in Block D, right below us here, that's still own rooted, uh -huh. but it's Merlot. It's it was it was grafted, so we have all oh. kinds of different things. We have Cabernet Sauvignon on their own roots. Uh -huh. It's one of the few one of the few uh, wines that you will find in America in the world. It's 30 years old. You can have Cabernet Sauvignon on its own roots, grown on its own roots. Huh. There's very few places in the world that you find 30-year-old Cabernet Sauvignon on its own roots. Because yeah. most of the places have been, have been replanted. Yeah. Uh, nothing in Europe. Nothing, in, very, very, very few in California. Um, so that's, that's kind of unusual. And then um, we, we grafted, uh, just recently we grafted Tempranillo onto Cabernet Sauvignon. And so, so this is your first Tempranillo? Uh, 2004 was. Uh -huh. Yeah, we, we grafted it in 2003. So it took Fantastic. 18 months. Uh -huh. And that was, that was interesting because they were, they were, you know, 30 years, they're really thick. We chainsawed them. We had to chainsaw uh -huh. them in half and then put the two sticks right in the, on top of the, uh, the, of the, you know, basically where we cut. And then we, we put them in and then we wrap them. Yeah. And then they just take off because there's four buds for 30 years of roots. Yeah. And it's tr a tremendous uh, amount of, of um, amount of energy Power, going up yeah. in the trunk, and so in 18 months we were able to get a relatively nice sized crop to make an 04, and it was a great year because 04 was a great year to make Tempranillo, and then subsequently the 05 was good, the 06 is really good, um, just follows the same patterns as the other varieties. It's a relatively easy variety to grow. Uh -huh. It ripens early. It's very well suited for our climate. Yeah. Um, shorter season. Uh, Viognier is the same way. Does very well in our climate here in the Applegate. Yeah. So how did you decide? You know, you personally decided. Uh, you know, like some kids, they kind of look at this and they think, oh, you know, uh, I think I'd rather be an engineer, or mm -hmm. I think I'd rather be, a, <laughs> you know, a stockbroker, or. Uh... I think it was a lot of um, a lot of working early on um, from the ground. You know, literally. Like you know, chores. Like your, your, your chores your being here. Um, going through the you know, going through the entire process, moving your way up, you know, learning every aspect of the business other than let's say the chemistry part uh -huh. of it, knowing that oh yeah, you put it in a tank, it it ferments, but I don't know how to do with that. I mean, but literally doing everything. Yeah. I mean, you know. From running the tractor to. From running the tractor, yeah, yeah. From you know, my first job was picking up rocks. Clear the. Uh, Just yeah, so the, yeah, so the so the mower would get hit. I mean, I was like eight or ten or something like that doing that. Yeah, and then just and then just moving all the way through, and, and it's nice to be able to have a business where you are, you, you do have an end process, you do have an, you know, you, you do the entire process, so you have, it's it, you know, it, it does. There's not a dull day. I mean, you're always looking at different the different processes all the way through. So some of the days I come in, I'm, you know, I, I work at the very end of the day, the end the end day where, or the end of the end of the line where uh -huh. uh, we're. Putting the putting the wine in people's car, to, you know, going down and seeing how the vineyard is, or talking to Mark about the vineyard, and because I don't really do a lot of vineyard things anymore, I do mostly sales. Uh -huh. But in terms of coming coming back, you know, we I uh, you know a lot of it had to do with my father. My father died when we were kids. Yeah. Um, he um, 
He started, you know, we started in 72, made our first wine in 1976. Our first two vintages were up in Tualatin. We, we brought the grapes up there. They were Cabernet Sauvignon. That was at uh, the Tualatin... Um, Tualatin uh, Vineyard, Tualatin yeah. Winery at that yeah. time. Yeah. And, um, and then in 1970... And who, who, who acted as winemaker? Um, the winemaker at Tualatin. Uh -huh. Yeah, he just made our fruit. Uh -huh. And uh, I forget his name. It escapes me. It's a long time ago. Um, Tualatin. Yeah, I forget what his name is. And then in 78, my father took this, the old barn down there and uh, refurbished it and, well, made it into a winery, essentially. Yeah. Put in a slab and lifted up the, lifted up the winery and put in, uh, put, um, you know, blocks around it. And we insulated it all and everything like that. And was that a, um, a practical decision because you had a building or, what, you know... Um, you know, now probably, it's a scenic. probably somewhat. You know, he definitely liked the historic, the historic aspect of everything. Mm -hmm. I think it was a combination. Hey, I already have this building. It's kind of neat. It's big. You know, I think I can do it. You know, engineers. You know, people think that they say, "Well, wasn't that interesting that he was an engineer?" Like somehow it would be odd. Like, well, not really, because engineers think that way. They always they're thinking. They, they don't think like other people think. They, they, think it, they, they think outside the box. And so he's probably saying, yeah, I can plant grapes here. I can do this. Or I can make this into a, a, a winery. So in 78, that was our first inaugural harvest. We have, and we, we hired a winemaker. And that was really the idea. My father was at that point had started another construction company uh -huh. here. And he did jobs around the, the area here, including a... Um, a bridge right above, uh, right near the dam at the end of this road here. There's a bridge there that he built, his construction company oh, built. Fantastic. So he had, uh, he had those type of projects. That this, and then he would, you know, because the, the vineyard was still getting going. It wasn't really a full-time job. And so, and he figured, you know, I need to hire somebody who um, knows what he's doing, which is, I think, was a good idea. Yeah. The, and, and to this day, we still think that's a good idea because we're, we're more important as the face of the winery, the sales part, the overall thing. We don't really want, we, we want, we want our winemaker to be just concentrating on making wine, thinking about those things and yeah. not be hampered by um, wine club shipments or things like that. So, yeah. um, so when, so we made our first, first two wines up there and then in 78, um, we opened up our tasting room in, inside the, ta inside the winery there oh, wow. and then uh, started selling wine. Uh -huh. And then um, in 1980, he was on one of his last jobs. In fact, he'd actually had sold the business to somebody else, and he was working for the Corps of Engineers, just being a, a, a diver. And he was um, he was diving um, to um, attach cables from for a dock. He, uh -huh. was, he was attaching cables underwater, and um, somebody was watching his free diving. Somebody was watching his bubbles, and all of a sudden they. They stopped. And where, where was that? Lost Creek Lake, which uh -huh. is north of here on the way to Crater Lake. It's a dammed, it's a man-made uh -huh. lake. Um, it dams up the uh, Rogue River. Uh -huh. So he was 44, and um, I was 12. I had my, my, my brother Mark was 16. I had my oldest brother was 18. It was during the summer. Uh, the, uh, my summer the summer where my, my uh, brother, my oldest brother, is going to go to Oregon State. My sister was already at Oregon State. Mm -hmm. She was older. And um, so a lot of that, just a lot of the information of, you know, we knew obviously what he wanted to have done, but we didn't really know the future, what he intended. I mean, there were still things like, okay, so he had this building he was going to build. You know, where was this pipe going to lead to? You know, was he thinking that, you know, was, were we going to, you know... <laughs> Was he thinking of you know doing everything underground, or was this some yeah. sort of a drainage pipe? So, um, so there was a lot of lot of turmoil because he knew both businesses, or you know, unless at least you know, thank God he had sold that business, but he was going to be full time here. Yeah, and so, um, so it was really difficult. There was only there wasn't very many. In fact, there was only uh, was in 1980. I think there was only two wineries in the whole area, maybe three, and. Um, when we started, there was only 12, I think, in Oregon. And so for the next five years, um, we just 
we the the winemaker that we had we had actually had fired. Yes, we did. We had fired him like a year after. Uh-huh. So we had another winemaker come in, and this is, you know, he was a Shakespearean actor who was a um, sheep farmer. Yeah. What a combination. <laughs> yeah, but he, he had a chemistry. Was he Italian or something? He was a too? chemistry. Yeah, yeah. No, he or was Spanish or no? He had no. He was, uh, <laughs> but he had a. I think he had. Yeah, I think he had a chemistry degree. So yeah, if if I said one day I should write a book myself <laughs> I, about the, the possibility of this, of this succeeding here. Now the person that knew everything and had the vision is gone. Yeah. Um, my mom was just doing the books and had no idea about wine at all. Yeah. We were all kids. And so, um, you know, how is it going to, how's it going to continue? So for the next five years, it was just, just survive. I mean, you know, we had, there was, uh, obviously there was, um, life insurance money and, and, uh, they never found his body. Holy cow. So there was never any, uh, and of course I was like, well, why do we need to find his body? You know, he's, he's dead, you know, 12 years old. I didn't realize that there was, you know, oh, you know, if you find his body and there's something wrong with the canisters, you know, there's some fault there, there's yeah. money there. Yeah. Um, but no, never found his body. So, um, so you know, life insurance went through that, and and uh, um, you know, we wouldn't buy we wouldn't buy fruit. We would just use our own fruit. Um, and in you know, 1980, so he died. You know, it was July 29th. So of course, it was right before harvest. Not to make the matter oh, worse. Man. And then, um, um, but in 1980, you know, just phenomenal years. I mean, 80, uh, 79 was great. 80 was great. You know, 82, 83 was great. Um, 84 was not that great. And but, your father died in You know, 80, in 80, 80. In 80. So, uh-huh. you know, we made a spectacular wines in 80 um, from this, you know, this winemaker. So who stepped and, up, um, I mean, uh, you know, to fill the void? I mean, how did you do that? I well, mean, that's a huge well void. what we did was we put a lot of the, a lot, it was pretty much everything was on to, on the uh, winemaker. Uh-huh. You know, my oldest brother went to college. Mark and I worked, pretty much did the same thing we did. You know, we would work in the vineyard, we would, we would label, we would bottle, um, we'd help the winemaker out. Uh-huh. Um, but he was the one making the decisions on styles, what we made, how much of what we made. Of course, a lot of that dictated of the vineyard part because, you know, whatever came out of the vineyard, we didn't have the option of going out and buying fruit from, you know, Del Rio yeah. <laughs> back then. So, so yeah, a lot of it was very strict of, uh, so, so we made good wines, but they were like a dry converse demeanor. Uh-huh. Great, great dry converse demeanor, but trying to sell try to sell a dry converse demeanor, especially back then. Now it's, you can probably do it, but not yeah. then, you know, it's difficult. So we had, you know, but, but then the thing that kept us going is we had a lot of, we made good wines. Uh, there were solid, um, you know, virtually no flaws at all. The winemaking was very clean. The fruit was good. And then on the other side, we had a lot of, we sold a lot of wine locally. I mean, our first, our first customer back in 78 was Jacksonville Inn. And um, still, 30 years, is still one of our best customers. And, um, you know, he'd sell the wine. So was that you know, a, a, um, a customer already that you had, or was that... Uh, no, no, we had... started right, right, pretty much right in 78, 79 there, I think. So you and Mark you know. started going out and beating the bushes? No, right? that was something my father oh, had, had started. Yeah, so, so he had already started planting the seeds of, hey, we're going to have a wine. And then we got a tremendous amount of press, too, because we're the only winery. Yeah. So, you know, we had, you know, I mean, when we were crushing grapes, we're on the front page of the paper. Yeah. Everybody knew there was a winery. Yeah. So that wasn't anything that was surprising. So we, so we had all this, you know, we had people, we, we, had the, we had the awareness level. And then we just started selling wine, you know, in retail stores, mostly independent stores, restaurants, things like that. And then we had our tasting room. People would come down. Uh-huh. And um, so we would be able to sell it. Then we had distributors. Well, we didn't have any distributors for those five years. That's another thing, too. We didn't have really any, any distributors. Yeah. We had a distributor in Medford, I think. So we, we, we did have a wholesaler that would help us in Medford. But for those five years, it was pretty much, it was pretty tough. I mean, it was just kind of like going through vintage by vintage. And in 1985, my oldest brother came back from Oregon State. And, um, you know, and we were here, you know, of course, Mark and I were here full time. And Mark went to Oregon State. And then, um, then we, 
needed to hire a new winemaker because John Eagle, who was the winemaker at the time my father had died, he had actually had moved on. We we got um, um, gosh, what? No, <laughs> it's one of those things where we uh, you have uh, a two year old and a five year old. You don't get enough sleep. Um, Rob Stewart uh-huh. from Big Fire used to work at uh, Big Fire Winery. Uh huh. Um, he he was our winemaker for about two years. Uh-huh. So and then he, and then he went he then after that after the eighty three to eighty five then he went to Staten Hills and stayed, from Staten Hills he went to Erath and then from Erath he started his own winery. So he's very well known in the Willamette Valley, good winemaker, uh-huh. and uh, he had a chemistry degree, and then he made um, you know good solid wines and and then, and then again you know the winemaker went out and showed the wines the winemakers did the festivals the winemaker went and did. Um, um, you know tastings, and it's not so much it's not so much different than a small winery even today, where the where the owners are just doing something else, and the winemaker pretty much does everything. Yeah. So that's kind of what it was like. And in 1985, my brother's coming back, and it was a spring, yeah, spring of 1985. Mark is coming now back. that would be Robert, my oh. brother Robert, and um, we we needed to hire a winemaker because Rob was going to go. So we said, well, why don't you go down to UC Davis and put out some posting that we wanted a winemaker. So. Yeah. Um, so one day I came back from you know high school, I'm 16 years old, and there's this guy in our kitchen table, and he's talking to my mom, and my mom's asking questions that, you know, I mean, actually, the, the winemaker's asking questions about, you know, where are you from, and my mom's asking, are you Catholic, and how do you feel about <laughs> life, and, and all this. And, and, all the important things. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, so, so at, at uh, let me see, he was 22, and so the day after he graduated UC Davis, he came, came up here. Uh-huh. And then my brother was also, I think they were both 20, 23. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Irish, yes. And, uh, well, Irish and he's, and, he's uh, and, and Spanish. Oh, Irish and Spanish? Yes. What a combination. Yes, oh, I know. gosh. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and we wanted to have a younger, a younger winemaker because here we were essentially taking over. We were going to come back and we were young and we didn't want to have a winemaker that was older. You know, here's these guys coming so you in communicate here. communicate or? Yeah, communicate, have, you know, and just to, to, to just hang out with, uh-huh. you know, ski, golf, ah. you know, hey, he's just one of our brothers, basically. Yeah. It's like, hey, here's another, kind of like another brother, yeah. same age. It's great. Well, he's six years older, but kind of like that. And so that worked great. Bob and John got along great. They went in. They said, okay, we're going to buy barrels. First thing, we have to buy barrels. Okay. And you so, didn't have any barrels. Well, we would buy, well, we had older barrels or we bought a little bit of barrels, but it wasn't the same as... Okay, let's go out and buy French oak barrels because we're going to make a Chardonnay. Uh-huh. And um, so John, in 1985, first thing came in, made this beautifully done uh, Chardonnay, full malactic, full blown. I mean, textbook UC Davis Chardonnay. Uh-huh. <laughs> that was fantastic. It was great. Everybody loved it. You know, it's like, wow, this is really nice. Nice and, you know, That's great an fruit. Investment. You're going out and, uh, and buying a bunch of barrels and things. Yeah, yeah, buying French oak barrels, fermenting in French oak barrels. Um, and then, then my brother went out and, and, and got distributors, and we changed the label. You know, d- did all the little things that would improve the quality out the door. And so that just started, you know, slowly but surely, you know, moving up. And in 1989, he left because his his dream was always to be um, a, uh, to be on the the, the the Pacific Stock Exchange or New York Stock Exchange, um, being a uh, a floor trader. The, the winemaker. No, my brother Bob. Oh, oh, oh yeah, my okay. brother Bob. Okay. Yeah, so my other brother Mark came in, I think in eighty nine, eighty eight. Um, so he came in, and and um, and of course I was going to college from nineteen eighty six to nineteen ninety one. So and and I was in Los Angeles, so I didn't really come back all the time. I was just back back for the summertime. Yeah. So I didn't know a lot that was going on. Just back for the summer, things like that. And, you know, change the labels again, uh, continue now, now purchasing fruit in 89 uh-huh. um, from other vineyards. So these other vineyards come in. And I've always said, people say, well, what do you, th- you know, are, are, you, are you all estate grown? I'm like, well, estate grown to me is just means absolutely nothing. Because, again, for my father to come here, there is no vineyards. And for him to find the best place to grow grapes is zero. 
this is not the best place to grow grapes. It's a good place to grow grapes. Uh -huh. But to think that there's not a better place to grow grapes is ridiculous. So why would we say that we're a state grown? Yeah. I mean, so what we do is we make sure that, that our vineyard's as best as it possibly can be. But if there's better fruit out there, we're not... We're not so big on ourselves to say, oh, no, it can't. It's not as good as our fruit. We'll go out and get it. Yeah. So we've always made the effort is we have to get the best fruit, you know, whether it be, um, you know, whether whatever variety it is, we're going to go out to that best fruit, whether it's in our vineyard or somebody else's vineyard. Yeah. You know, we want to get it. So, um, so we started getting fruit, you know, new vineyard sites, new clones, you know, Quail Run Vineyard starts coming in, and then subsequently Del Rio oh, comes yeah. in. And, and all of a sudden the fruit just, they, you know, what would happen is that we'd have these these um, these years in which, um, like, 89, 9, 90 was a phenomenal year. So 90, you know, 90 comes in, and we're getting new fruit, and it's a great year, plus you have these new vineyards come in. And then 91, 92, 93, are, they're okay. And then, you, you know, you have more vineyards, and all of a sudden you hit a 94. Uh -huh. And there's, again, phenomenal years. Like, it just kind of stair-stepped up as you had these great years. So in 90, we just had an extraordinary year. It was a combination. We had some winter freeze, so which left us with a little bit less fruit. But the fruit that we had was just absolutely amazing. And it wasn't a whole lot of it. And, you know, this was what, and I would come back, but by this time I am, you know, I'm, I'm tasting wine. I'm tasting through the wines. And I'm like, this is, this is not even, you know, where these wines come from. And this doesn't taste like anything we've made. So, you know, we bottled them up. Chardonnay was unbelievable. And so we bottled them up. And my brother said, you know, we need to come out with a different label. We've, we've, we've toyed around with these other labels. We need to come out with a, with a higher end label. These are way better than the price point where we are. And these labels, you know, pretty much labels are kind of in a price point. So it's a marketing and, kind of a... Yeah, and, and we want to be at a different price point. We can't take this label up. So we had to start off brand new with a new price, a new a new package, and the whole thing. So that's where the Anna Maria decided to come in. Named, that's a, that's named it after my mom. So, so we developed the Anna Maria label, and um, the first wine was our Anna Maria Chardonnay. So we and that was in what year? 1990. 1990. So in 1991, summer of 1991, yeah. So it was going to be it was going to be released like the fall of 91, I believe. So we find out that it wins a double gold medal in the World Wine Championships in Slovenia. So it was one of the top Chardonnays in the world that year. And um and we knew it was we know we knew it was good. And then we get this award and then with the Anamaria label and that really that really just was a huge um Huge step for that label. I mean, right off the bat, winning that big award, getting in a newspaper, everybody knew about it. Again, we were, you know, this was 19, so this was 1990, 92, essentially, like just right in the beginning of 1992. You know, Jacqueline wanted to buy the glass. We sold it to buy the glass. We only had like 300 cases. We, we sold that wine out so fast. It was amazing. And to this day, if you go to Jacksonville, there's, a, there's, a, there's the 2006 Anna Marie Chardonnay. Huh. Yeah, 14 vintages later. Um, wow. Still, still by the glass, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, and it it is really the wine, and we only make a lot of people don't even know we make Chardonnay. I mean, we're we're mostly known for, you know, Bordeaux varieties and then Rhone varieties. Now, of course, we're known as this ten great Tempranillo producer, but we do five to six hundred cases of an Anna Maria Chardonnay. It's almost only sold out of the winery and the Jacksonville Inn and a few other retail uh -huh. stores. That's it, and it's a local type of wine, people, and it's the wine that people. You know, and we don't make it every year. That's the other thing about the Anna Maria label. We, we pretty much said right in the beginning, we're not going to make Anna Maria wines every year. So don't come, just don't, if, if you want to look at, if, if you want to see, or if, or if you're looking for a winery that's going to tell you, you know, it's great every year, or if you're looking for every year, if any sort of consistency in labels or any sort of consistency, you're not, we're not the winery for you. Yeah. What you need to know that is if we put this label on, you don't have to think about it. It's good because in, because in, 90, because in 91, we didn't make an Anna Maria label. And then we, we pretty much in every other year and until we, and then of course, we had a whole bunch of new, you know, new clones of Chardonnay come up that, that, have, that have been growing. And we can almost do one, maybe one, you know, maybe two out of every three years we can make an Anna Maria Chardonnay. Uh -huh. So, um, but it's not every year. And, so who, you know, who's the designer? So. 
Um, it's between Mark and I and John. And John's still the winemaker. Still uh -huh. for 20, this will be his 21st harvest. Is that right? Yeah. 20, 22nd harvest. Yeah, 22nd harvest. Um, it's not as difficult as people would think. It's, it's pretty much a yes or no. Uh -huh. it, it's not... It's not, wow, this is really close, or, yeah. boy, I don't know. It's pretty five. much, you know, it's pretty much, yeah, yes, it is, and no, it isn't. So um, so that's kind of what, you know, that's where the, you know, in terms of where we were from 90, you know, 85 to 90, and then 90 to, let's say, um, I would say probably 2000, just a series of really good years, continue with the Anna Maria label, making more, um, we started branching out, and um, we still sold vast majority of wines in in the state of Oregon, in uh -huh. Jackson County. We had just you know we we kind kind of consolidated our distribution under Columbia Distributing during like ninety three or ninety four, to where we only have one distributor made it a lot easier. Started going out and getting other distributors throughout the United States. At one point, I think we had seven, uh -huh. and um, and then in two thousand. Um, well, in 2000, 1999, well, it's basically even back towards 1988, 1998, we wanted to have a new taster room because we knew, well, first of all, we have some phenomenal wines coming out in 99. So it, must, it was kind of like 98, 99 in that area that we really wanted to, and we needed to have, the business was growing, we needed to have our own offices. We were like in this one office about not even the same size, size as two desks, one computer, and, you know, we'd have you know, dial up internet and, you know, and then of course I started doing phone sales and some internet sales even back in, you know, even in 88, 98, 97 even, uh -huh. doing some small internet sales and then getting our website up finally. And then we were shipping more. And so it started just kind of like more and more retail, retail, retail. And, and we, and we, we, we looked upon doing, we looked at doing, uh, you know, expanding down there, but we thought, you know what, this is not, this is a working winery. It's not a showcase winery. And to turn something like that around, it's going to be a lot of effort. But we had this piece of property up here. You know, we already had the well right here. Everything was, was perfect right next to the road. Yeah. And so in 1990, we said, you know, we really need to make a, a big statement here. We've been doing for you know, literally 15 years. We've made progress that no one can see except for in the bottle. You know, we bought barrels. No one sees barrels. No one sees vineyards. No one sees how good the grapes are. But they see what the what the the end result is. Yeah. They they, they yeah. see that what's in the bottle, or they taste what's in the bottle. It's getting better and better and better. But they never. They, we never did anything outwardly expressive that would say, "Hey, this is a, this is really changed. The winery has changed." Yeah. And really, it's it kind of was a you know kind of psychological even even marketing wise where this was kind of a new venture for us having a new tasting room so it it it, it kind of was um again just uh, just showing that we are evolving we're at the cutting edge a lot of times we're i'm i'm very very cognizant of the fact there's a lot of these new wineries here and so i always i always feel that since we're the oldest wineries i winery i don't want to feel that we're getting that we feel like, oh, they're just resting on their laurels. So uh -huh. I always want to, you know, so we're always looking at new varieties to do. We're doing all these different varieties, different, we're doing a port now, late harvest. Mm -hmm. Viognier, we're, we're, we're growing Roussan mm -hmm. too. So we're, we're, we're always looking at the next variety to, to become, to be, you know, on, you know, just on the cutting edge to make sure that, that people don't think that we're just sitting here and, so so the tasting room idea was um you know a big thing is we had to borrow money we never borrowed money before uh, <laughs> so we had to borrow money so for that we had to ask my mom and my mom said well you know i don't know how you guys sell 20 dollar bottles of wine anyway so i guess <laughs> i guess you can do it <laughs> so um so um and again, everything we've always done has always been shoestring. And we thought, you know, we don't want this to be just cookie cutter. We don't want to do this. So we brought in an architect. Uh -huh. And it, local, we want to do everything as local as possible. And um, he had worked on projects similar to this. And, and he said, okay, I want you to draw. I don't want you to draw boxes. So, you know, his idea was, I want a vision. I want, I don't want, I don't want boxes, which is good because, you know, we didn't, we didn't inherit my father's genetic um, dispositions for engineering. Uh -huh. So, 
Well, oh, just out of so, curiosity, what did you graduate with? What oh, economics. Economics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my two, my and my and my, and my brothers were uh, um, finance. Huh. So a little different. Mostly, you know, their numbers. Mine mostly just pub, uh, you know, behavioral, yeah. psychology, behavioral things like that. Yeah. So we gave him what we wanted, which was we wanted to bring the outside in. We wanted to take advantage of our three hundred days of sunshine. We wanted to, you know, ground. And we wanted to have a, you know. You know, nice space where people can, you know, we can do some events, big enough, but it's small enough to where it's not cavernous. So he came up with this design, and then he, um, he, we were, we were, so we built it the 2001 spring summer 2001, uh -huh. and um, and so we were we were essentially in charge of um, the flooring, the lighting, and the bar. That was our thing three things that we had to do and the flooring so my wife and I went down to Sonoma and we we looked at the flooring and and um and we liked the concrete floor and then we then we saw lighting we said well you know we went to all these wineries in Sonoma and we some lighting was very poor we wanted to light it we thought we know the lighting is very important we're gonna have a tremendous amount of ambient light but we need so we need spotlight so we got these dimmable fluorescents uh -huh. and back then they were relatively new technology to have dimmable fluorescents and then we had these spotlights too to spotlight different things on the wines and the bar the bar was interesting the bar we had built for us we we had gone to an event in Salem and it was a three-day event and we were we it was a wine event it was a uh -huh. wine festival and we every day we come in we walk by this guy and he had these desks and file cabinets as we started talking to him and, he, and found out that he worked for the Oregon State Penitentiary and huh. so we, we kind of like, this is really nice work. I mean, it's over-the-top work for a, for a file cabinet. And so we said, would you ever think about doing a bar? And he thought, oh, that would be great because these guys, I mean, all they do is work on file cabinets. This would be a signature piece that they can put in the public. So we said, okay, we're, we'll go back and we'll, we'll, design, we want, we'll design our bar. So we came out, so Mark and I designed this entire bar, circular bar, freestanding, not very many freestanding circular bars. Uh -huh. And then I would, when I was down Sonoma, we, we need to find a, a top, and we really liked copper because it was soft. It was metal, but it was a soft metal. It wasn't like, so when you put your glass down, it didn't feel like, you know, you had to really put it down. You could actually put it down pretty, you know, yeah. at, at a regular, you know, amount. It made a cool sound. You could clean it. And so we gave him the entire plans, and they built it at the Oregon State Penitentiary. Is that right? In the prison. <laughs> <laughs> in the prison. And then... He said, it's done, and we said, great, can you take it down? He's like, well, I don't know. I said, well, i tell you what, you bring it down, we'll take you out to dinner, we'll put you up at the Jacksonville Inn. And he says, okay, I'll bring my son down. So, and we brought it down, and then he put it, you know, we put it together, we helped put it together, and they took pictures for, for these guys to see. How cool and we that? And since then, we've actually had, I believe, two to three guys that have been in prison, out of prison, to come and look at it. How cool is that? Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah. Yeah. And there's a little inscription in the bar saying, you know, Oregon State, you know, penitentiary woodworking, uh -huh. you know. And they didn't sign it, you know, so, like Al Capone and... No, but they did. It was funny because they had all fingerprints on the, on the copper, you know, which was really <laughs> interesting. But, so, that, so that was the only piece, actually, that wasn't local. Uh -huh. But it was kind of a neat, <laughs> a neat story. But everything else we used local because, you know, that was... It was really neat because that was really what kind of kept us going was the local people. And so we, you know, we, a lot of the, the people we used, all the subs were all local, friends of ours, things that, you know, yeah. that we can do. Yeah. And then when we were building it, so we were, you know, here we're building it. And I'm, I go off because I was able to get a distributor in New York City. We had a distributor in New York years ago. And, you know, and, and you know, you, you, you win, you know, sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. And so... Um, you uh, so we were. I was back there doing a, doing a wine festival or doing a wine tasting, their fall wine tasting in New York, and uh, and I was like, this is great. This is a, this is the perfect house for us. And tomorrow I'm going to go out and we're going. I'm going to sell wine in New York City. It's so cool to be back here. And my you know my parents were you know were originally from New Jersey, so it's uh -huh. kind of neat to go back there and sell wine there. And we had a distributor there before, and I had worked the market there. And it's just really cool to, to sell wine in New York. It's really, it's, it's a it's a cool ego thing uh -huh. to do that. So, um, so, so that was Sunday. Sunday was the, no, Monday was the tasting. Mm -hmm. So Tuesday, I wake up, I'm all ready to go. It's a beautiful day, Manhattan. 
I get ready to get on the bus, and it was uh, 9-11. Oh. So... So you were in New York then. Yeah, I was in Manhattan, oh, like cow. 30 blocks away. So I, so I got on the bus, wow. and, you know, we... I spent like five days and you know five days trying to get home and end up getting home on Saturday, and and one of the nights I was just thinking, what am I doing here? You know, I, you know, what are we doing? You know, we're, we're giving our wine away. You know, where it's going half price, it's being shipped across the country, so we can go through the distributor to the retailer to the customer, mm-hmm. and you know we have you know I'm going to have a kid and we're building this new tasting room, and that was really an interesting point because. After that, um, you know, for the last for the for the three months after that, you know, the whole New York market just collapsed. Yeah. You know, wine tasting everything. So they said, you know, I can't sell your wine. We're like, fine. So we opened up the tasting room. I think it was November first. I think it was the end of October two thousand one. Uh-huh. And uh, people had come in here and and uh, had a great time. And 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 in fact, it was what was interesting is that when I. After September, through September 11th, October, oh September, we had a, we, uh, so it was October, first couple of days of October. I'm talking to our, to our distributor, Columbia, and the guy says, "You know," he says, "I think you're the only winery in the entire book that actually saw an increase year to date, really, from 01 to 02, from from 2000 to 2001." Wow. And I said, "Well, I said that's interesting because and because we are because we're positioned so such an odd position where we sell so much wine in Southern Oregon uh-huh. and so much wine retail. So it so we were completely insulated from the because the restaurants is what took the hit, not so much retail, but it was the restaurants that took the hit. And then um, and then the other thing was you know it's the same thing we we've always wanted to sell more wine retail just direct direct uh-huh. to the consumer we were we're good at it we 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 like dealing with the public and um and we don't we just you know and going back to my father you know i mean he was i was 12 when he died but one of the things i remember is he he always remembered cut out the middleman if you ever uh-huh. can cut out the middleman sure and to this day that's what we do we try to go direct to the consumers and yeah. and give them the best deal why should why should we you know, why should we go into business to have other people have a business to make money off our business, you know, (laughs) or, you know, it's, it's one of those, it's one of those things. And, and, you know, you know, you work so hard to get the product, you know, why share it with somebody else? Why don't just go directly to the consumer, give them a better deal yeah, and then ship it to them. You know, I can ship it to people to New York and I ship wine to New York all the time. It's much easier to ship wine in New York and it's being the same price than having to go through a three tier system. Yeah. So, and you know, so, so we opened up the taste room and that was, that was a very interesting weekend because we'd have people come up to us literally crying. I mean, they were Speaking crying. of your success. Yes. Came in crying and I was like, the whole weekend I was like, oh my gosh. And it was like, oh, where's your father? And you know, they would know the family, your father would be so proud. And uh, there was, there, you know, cool. that was really cool. Yeah. And I was like, and, and so for, cool. for, for, for the whole weekend, I was like, I did not expect that. So I was like totally caught off guard. So, you know, you know people were, I mean, they were crying. I was like. I was like, it's really For cool. A tasting room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and because they knew that this was our thing. This was something that we had done. We were completely out of this other building. We this was our own thing, and so and it showed that hey, you have arrived. You know, so it was more than just the building. It was yeah. very symbolic for us. And now, what was funny? Then the other thing was what was interesting is people would say, you know, and it, and it also coincided to these fantastic ninety nine wines that we came out. So again, we just rolled out these unbelievably great wines they'd won all kinds of awards and again it was just it just took us up a whole nother level you know came out with a really nice brochure the wines were a lot more expensive and people were people didn't it didn't it totally was fine but even though we and we're very very price conscious very price sensitive because we're in that you know we're constantly monitoring what the public is going to take and and we, and we take it very seriously we just don't put forty dollars like we well, we never put fifty dollars on a wine. We just don't put fifty dollars on a wine just because, oh, this is what everybody else is doing. Yeah. yeah. You know? And the reason we don't have to put fifty dollars is not half of it's going re- half of it's going wholesale. So, you know, when we're putting when we're, if we're gonna put a wine out that's thirty five or forty dollars, which is very rare, it is absolutely phenomenal. Uh-huh. And if we're putting wines out that are twenty five, they're usually as good or better than any you know, the Claret just won the Claret just got a higher one of the highest awards from uh, Northwest Wine Press. It got an outstanding, uh-huh. and the wine from Leonetti 
a Bordeaux blend that's one hundred and ten dollars was it was less. I mean, it was it got only a recommended. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. So you know, so we're getting really good reviews. So we're, we've always been that way. And, and what was the other interesting part about the, when the, the when people would say, they said, "Wow, this must have really been." Uh, a real risk for you guys to do this, you know, and, and I said risk, I said I said that's an interesting word that you say risk I mean, I don't, I don't look at this as risk I think of coming to country with four kids with no job and planting grapes where there was not been grapes, that's risk yeah. it, that's already been done this is just, this is just building a building for, the, for as good as the wines are uh-huh. to match the building with the yeah. wines and uh, and so that and people are like, yeah, I guess you're right, you know. <laughs> so what's the future? You know, yeah. look like both for for you guys, and we'll say like uh, Southern Oregon wine. Um, I think I think the big thing is going to be our uh, the awareness level outside the region. We we you know we really have a very strong following in Southern Oregon. There's no other region in and Oregon. Southern Oregon now, like, what do you, you, know? what do you say Southern Oregon? I mean, is Roseburg? Right, so, Ro- Roseburg, yes. You know, Roseburg, the, the, also the Appalachian, yeah. Southern Oregon yeah. Appalachian. I, I think, I think we're going to continue to get national attention. We're, we're, mm-hmm. we're going to start to get national attention or we're going to continue. Yeah, we're going to continue to get the, well, we, we've already had a really good run for the last year of, of national attention, and I think that's going to continue as people learn more. About, and the fact there's wineries now, for there to be wine writers, and tr- well, mostly travel writers going to write about us, and then I think the wine writers will catch on. I, yeah. I think because I want wine writers tend to be. Um, you know, they're they're not going to. They don't seem to be bl- blazing new trails. Uh, you know, the creamery or the, all the other. Either gore, you know, either travel or food-related items, and then they leave with, you know, a good can be heard from for a while. No, that's not happens. The more articles you get, the more articles you're going to get in the future. Yeah. So now, is there any paths. competition so, with the, the, you know, the quote, the boys up north? How, how does that? Is that a symbiotic? Is that a? You know, a I would say uh, I would say it's um, it's practically not. We're making different. That I think that. Um, because of that, I think we weren't getting a lot of attention, or they were, you know, they obviously got a lot of attention. They've done a great job marketing, you know, the Pierre Noir aspect in Northern Oregon. And I think for a long time, you know, you know, we're down here doing our own thing, and, and we weren't getting that attention. And so I think we were, I don't know, not so much jealous of what they were doing, but certainly kind of felt left out a little bit. Um, but now, as you see a lot of the Northern Oregon wineries making fruit from down here, yeah. um, it's changed the dynamics a lot. And so we're able to talk to them. Um, like for example, I mean, you know, if I'm in a, ta- if I'm in the same room as, you know, Domaine Serene, but I really don't have a lot talked about, you know, we'd make Chardonnay together, you know, uh-huh. we do, you know, they make really good Chardonnay. But now they have their whole rock block series. You know, I'm talking to their winemaker. I'm talking to them, and you know, we go over there and compare notes. We try each other's wines, and it be and it, and it becomes a much better relationship north to south, and um, and I think in the long run, it's it's just a lot. You know, the wines are you know the wines are better overall. Uh, you know, better, uh, I just think um, I think the wine quality has gone way up. The wine for, quality here or overall? or uh, I think the wine quality I think the wine quality in Southern Oregon has gone way up in uh-huh. the past five years. Uh-huh. And um, and I think what happens is that it just seems as it, things are pointing in our direction in terms of Southern Oregon, the consistency of climate, uh-huh. the, the, the people wanting to do, the, the, the things to do other than just the wine, the, you know, we have a tremendous uh, advantage to some other, to some other, even even other wine regions where you can, you can wine taste during the day, and then you can go see a a, a world class Shakespearean yeah. performance at night, yeah. and um, and go to the Brit festivals and other things. So we have a lot to do here just besides wine wine tasting. Yeah, and um, but in terms of the the varieties that we're doing is another thing. Again, we're just there's so many different varieties that we can grow here, and that's one of the one of the one of the problems that we had is that we there were so many different varieties that we we made. We had a hard time getting the word out 
that hey, this you know we're we're growing all these different varieties. We're up north. They had a real singular mission. Uh huh. Pierre Noir. And, and, they, Pinot and it's and Pinot Gris, and, but but Pinot Noir was really the the main focus, and that got everybody in the door. Yeah. And then they poured their Pinot Gris. Yeah. You know, we've never been able to get them really in the door yet. Uh-huh. I mean, once they come here, then they're like, oh yeah, I guess you make all these things. So even even though our strength really was our weakness, our strength of being able to to to, to do to ripen all these varieties. Yeah. Is all was also our our weakness of not being able to go out and focus marketing as opposed to saying, yeah, these are the varieties we do. And you know, Willamette Valley is pretty much the only region in the world that promotes that promoted a a, a, a variety over a region. If you go over the, across the world, you know, even Napa Valley doesn't just do Napa Valley Cab, even though Cabernet is kind of the dominant variety or at least the variety that most people know. They just say come to Napa Valley. Yeah. So, you know, and so it's not that's you know we're kind of falling that line. You know, yeah, we do a lot of different varieties. Just come and taste the wine. Yeah. You know, so so I think the big thing is 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 certainly the awareness outside of the region, and then just the increase of the the, the increasing um, numbers of visitors that we're going to get, and the ability to we have an Applegate Valley Wine Trail, and we have an Applegate Valley Vis, uh, Vintners Association uh-huh. to be able to um, you know organize to do events together, um, to have a brochure, and then just the also, as, which has been very important, is the Visitors Association now, you know, every year when they rank why people come to Southern Oregon. We used to be 20th. Wine, the wine industry. Yeah, 18 to 20th. Now we're like third. Really? What, what's, a, no. what's, what's above, what's first and second? Oh, I'd say Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Shakespeare, um, maybe Crater Lake. Is, uh-huh. is always up uh-huh. there. Shakespeare, Crater Lake, um, let me see, Shakespeare, Crater Lake, uh, the, you know, Rogue River, or, you know, jet boating, rafting, but we're in the top five now. I don't know if we're third, but definitely in the top five. Yeah. So we've shot right up there. So now, so now every time there's a travel writer that comes through, we're on the list. Yeah. I mean, we're all of a sudden, we're getting phone calls. We got a travel writer coming in. This is, this is we've already set a time up for you. This is your time slot. Yeah. Great. Bring them uh, on in, yeah. you know, and then and then the creamery, the food aspect has exploded. I mean, it's all come together really nicely. I mean, I mean, Rogue Creamery is really the focal point. Obviously, Harry and David. So you have Harry and David, then you had the Rogue Creamery, and it just it you know it just it didn't it just it was a perfect time for them to come in, and then you have um, you know the chocolate. You know that the, the chocolatiers around town—they're all doing their specialty I chocolates. I don't know. Much um, about well, Dagoba, you have Dagoba chocolate, okay. which is a you know, larger organic producer, and then uh-huh. you have Lavelle Farms, which does really nice. Um, you, they use Dagoba chocolate, but they do, you know, different chocolate. Um, you know, like do ganaches or oh, okay, uh, right. you raspberry creams oh, and okay. things like yeah. that. So the so food, and then you and then you have um, different cheese places you know you have uh, a cheese place up in Cisco Crest De- goat cheese uh-huh. you have two goat cheese which are very good yeah. um, and so the whole and then there's a uh, a buffalo uh, bison ranch that's all organic bison ranch that's really? in the Applegate down in Williams uh-huh. so the whole food aspect is is I think going to drive that's really going to drive the region is the is the agritourism part of it in, in, encompassing both the wine and and the food part, not just not so much like they did. So, like, like in ten happen. years, like what, what do you when you look out on the landscape down here in ten years, what, what do you see? Um, I could probably see in the Applegate or the entire Rogue Valley. I think there, I think there'll probably be. If you're talking about the, I think there'll be more wineries. Uh-huh. Um, easily another yes. Oh, that's <laughs> Like that. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Okay, I'll be on. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I definitely think more wineries. Uh-huh. I, I think we'll get. Uh, um, I think there'll there'll be some that come and go, but there'll be more brick and mortar wineries. I think there'll be. Um, By brick and mortar, um, you mean traditional? Uh huh. Traditional wineries, not just the vineyards putting out their own wine. Okay, out of the um, garage or something. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I think you'll see the varieties. I think you'll see Tempranillo and Viognier. I think Viognier has got tremendous potential here. 
I, I mean, so much to be, I think that it's going to be one of the top places to grow Viognier in, in, in the United States. That's a compliment. I was you know. just trying a little bit of your Viognier, mm -hmm. and I really, really liked it. Yeah. I didn't really get enough time, but uh, yeah. it was really nice. And so we're hoping to really get on that, you know, where, because Viognier is a very fast growing variety, and really try to ride that and become the place to grow. And I think Tempranillo as well. I think we can really make inroads with that. And then the other varieties, and then just to improve the, the overall. You know, to prove, to be more, you know, to be consistent, you know, do as much as we can climate wise. How do you compete you know, against, you know, it's like a lot of what you're trying to do is also Walla Walla. You know, and those guys have done a pretty nice job of marketing and. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, the know, town, yeah. Oh, absolutely. The town yep. and the whole, whole region. I just yep. came uh, last week, I guess I was up in the Walla Walla on the Oregon side because I'm just looking at. Uh, yeah, at Oregon. Yeah, and they're mm -hmm. actually. You know, they're starting to try to differentiate themselves from, like, across the border. And there's Seven Hills, uh, mm -hmm. you know, vineyard. I mean, yeah. it's really a nice vineyard. Oh, yeah, yeah. So how, how do you, you know, um, is, is that competition or, you know, how do you profile yourself with that? Um, I don't know. You know, I, I always look at it as that there's so much more wine that's purchased than Oregon wine. I mean, we, you know, even in Oregon, we don't have nearly as much of a, we don't have that big of a market share. So, you know, my whole thing is that we don't have to create wine drinkers. We just have to change what they're drinking. Yeah. And so I don't really look at that as being a huge competition because I also believe that they're getting people from, from I know we're getting people from Portland, so we're probably competing against people from Portland. You know, most of our visitors from California, although our biggest growth has been from people from Oregon coming in. And then uh, also Seattle, but um, but for years we get more people from California coming up. So is, and are they? You know, is it destination or is it drive through? It's destination. Huh. It's destination. They're not. They're actually not. A lot of them don't drive through. I, I mean, there's. You'd be amazed at how many don't know. Well, they know by now that there's wine grown in in, in the northern part of Oregon. But let's say five years ago, they would say, "Oh, there's wine. There's wine in southern Oregon. There's wine in northern Oregon," um, because they come up. You know, it's 95 degrees outside. They're drinking Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah. They're, they're, they don't look at it that much. And okay. they come up, they're sick of Napa Valley. They're sick of Sonoma. They're sick of the, the crowds, the, the fact that they're not talking to anybody that actually makes the wine or has anything to do with the winery. And they just come here and they just love it. they just like, this is what I used to remember Napa and Sonoma being like. Yeah. Family runs small wineries. Yeah. And so that we're getting a lot of mileage from that, and we're getting a lot of mileage from working together. Um, you know, wineries. I mean, people really like that as a as a. Um, they don't like to see. I mean, people in general don't like to see one, uh, businesses. You know, be co competitive. I mean, it, it, they they can have a nice friendly competition, but um, we actually go. It's it's almost it's it's really amazing what we do. I mean, if someone if you know if. Bridgeview has trucks going up and down the you know west coast all the time because they're so much bigger than we are, or they they they're not so much bigger than we are. They're they're really large and we don't we don't our wine doesn't go out on trucks at all, but they have empty trucks going up. Uh -huh. So if there's an empty truck going up, they call us. Hey, do you need a load of glass? And then we say, well, we'll do half. We'll call up Troon, uh -huh. and if Troon's going down to get, hey, I'm going down to get you know you know, our liquor or our distilled, you know, yeah. spirits for our port, do you want any? Yeah, sure, bring it up. So there's a tremendous amount of, of, of working of relationships and working together, marketing together huh. all the time. And do you feel you that know? too with, uh, you know, like the people up north and uh, south or is that, you know, is it pretty much like that cooperative uh, oh, it's just pretty much just regional, regional regionals, yeah. Because because uh -huh. of our because we're big enough now as Applegate Valley, we have our own brochure, our own our own wine trail. We got the whole thing right here. Uh -huh. um, so we actually we we actually don't even even the road guys. It's funny we we'll work with them in a SOA Southern Oregon Winery Association. Uh -huh. But if but in terms of marketing our own you know ads and events, we only do the Applegate. Yeah, it's huh. it's it's actually kind of it's splintering off a little bit, um, to where they're doing their own. They may do their own event, where we have our own weekend event where we you know we we do we do our our uh, 
barrel tour twice a year uh -huh. in the Applegate Valley called yeah. Uncorked. Yeah. And so we do that twice a year. And they, they can go up and down the winery. And, you know, we have a great advantage here. I mean, our geog geographically, we have a huge advantage here uh, where we have a great setup because we essentially have one road. One road, right. 238. Right. We have two towns, Jacksonville, you know, Jacksonville on the west side, or on the east side, and Grants Pass on the west side. You can stay there, you can, and you can just do one. You can do a loop. Uh -huh. It's very easy. And a lot of people, they'll go, if they start in Ashland, they always say, go out to the furthest end, Troon, you uh -huh. know, and then work your way back. And then some people go, you know, whatever, which way. I mean, we have groups, Sunday, we have two groups of 30. And we had to, we had to make sure that they're going to start, they're going to stop with, at us and Troon. So we had to make sure that the one of them stopping for lunch here, uh -huh. One of them's just going. One of them just has a group of thirty going, so they're like, okay, let's let's have you know, I'll have this group start here because you're you're doing lunch, so I'll have them start at eleven and they'll just cross each other and then they won't meet up. Yeah. So it's that sort, and then at the same time, Wilders Creek is doing their wine club release, so we know that that's going on. So we know that that's going to add in some. They have a very large wine club. They they only sell wine out of their wine club. Huh. So they've got a thousand members, so they'll get six or seven hundred people. So it'll be really busy wow. here in Applegate this weekend. So we have to know that we have to staff for that, because yeah. there'll be an extra five hundred people driving, driving by, by yeah. and they'll probably say, "Hey, let's stop at Valley View." Yeah. So there's a lot of that. We have to know what's going on. In fact, we do so, and so much so that we actually call up to say, "What are you doing?" So we can do our events later. Yeah. We can do our events another time. So Mike, what's for so, you? You know, like in the, the time that you've been doing this. What's for you been like just a, a fantastic euphoric moment like, oh, this really worked or this is uh, uh, like a high point or it's something like you kind of struggled with? I mean, you've mentioned, you know, some things, but, you know, like a real high point for you. Um, I think when you when we do things like Tempranillo, where it's it's a shot in the dark in a way. I mean, we kind of, you know, in a way, it's a shot in the dark. We don't know. We have 30 year old Cabernet vines. And so where did that idea, I mean, you know, where's, where does that come from? It's a, it's, it's kind of a consensus. I mean, you know, certainly, uh, you know, are you looking up North to Earl? And Earl, Earl, and... or, you know, Earl started the conversation. Earl huh. was a customer of ours back when he lived in Alabama. Huh. And we really? We'd ship wine back to him. Huh. When he was a dermatologist, and uh -huh. he said he, that that's one of the reasons why he came out here. He was like, "You guys are making pretty good wines." I can, so, so we've we've known him for years, and yeah. so we respect him. And he said, "Hey, you know what?" And which is another great another great story about working together. He, you know, he said, "I think you guys should try growing Tempranillo on the Applegate." And we're thinking, you know, we're we're kind of thinking the same thing. And he says, "Well, I tell you what, if you find, you know, if you want to do it, just call me and I, and, I, and I'll set the cuttings down." Yeah. So he did. He gave us cuttings. And people just, if you, you tell that to someone in California, they're like, so he gave you cuttings so you can make wine to compete against his. Uh -huh. I said, yes, that's why. Yep, that's what he did. Yeah. And, when, and when we won two gold medals in a row, what did that make him feel? That made him feel great. Because now there's another great Tempranillo grower in Oregon. And now there's, a, you know, and what happens is that, is that yeah, the whole rising tide lifts all boats <laughs> yeah yeah you know theory where now maybe somebody will come up and do a story about Tempranillo now you've got two or three people Put making to visit you know yeah. yeah so certainly that 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 was a great thing I mean to be a, and then the port the, the port that we're coming out with um the 2006 port that we're going to be coming out in November um you know Tempranillo is one of the port grapes and, and we we wanted to make a port and and it's just for John to make one never made a port never Great fruit, knew exactly what to do, yeah. didn't even know what... So where did that idea come from? I mean, it just like you're sitting around, and, you know, after three glasses of wine and... Um, oh, see, I mean, we, we can't just say that it, it just comes out of our own. I mean, obviously, Troon does a great port. Uh-huh. Um, so we're like, well, we should make a port. Sometimes we come up with the idea, sometimes we don't. And certainly we make Viognier because El Cove made a great Viognier from, from, Vion, from uh, Del Rio. Uh -huh. And we were down when Brad, when Brad Potter said, hey, why don't you come down and try this Viognier? And we're just like, this is really good. This is really, really good. It's out of a barrel. And so literally, we're driving down the driveway. We called up Del Rio. He said, we want six tons of Viognier. Uh -huh. so it's time and they make, had it? And they had it. 
Really? And we said, we thought to ourselves, you know, we can't have Southern Oregon fruit coming up here and being this good and not, and not make it ourselves. We have to, you know, and it's a, first of all, it's a great variety. It's a wonderful white variety. Uh-huh. And, and, and then we also said, well, we're not going to put in oak. <laughs> but but we knew exactly we came back we said John was and John's been making it by for his own and we said we're going to do Viognier and we're going to do it in stainless steel and he said well you know what that's exactly what I was thinking too because he had tried it now and he didn't like it uh-huh. he's like you know well, let's just do it in stainless steel and now what four years later we're considered one of the top Viognier producers in, in America huh. you know five five years later yeah and uh, and that's just it's a tribute to John too. I mean, he's a great winemaker. Twenty two years, and sometimes we take it for granted. You know, hey, it's a great year. In '06, you know, everybody can make good wines. Well, when they don't, it's it's the it's the old, it's the 2005 vintage. That's what separates the the struggle years. The years like maybe this, if this continues for another week, like it's supposed to. Those are the type of years, and you and you can still make good wine out of it. Yeah. Those are the years. Those are the type of, of years that really show how good a winemaker is. And the port, yeah. you know, when you when and the port's amazing. So what's been like the so. biggest, um, I'll say, disappointment? I mean, like you do you do this long enough and there's, God, there's got to be times when you go, oh, you know, that just didn't work or this. this. Well, I think there's a lot of, there, there seems to be, in, it, you can't get too high and you can't get too low. I mean, I look at the, you know, and, and we have, we do, as I said, we do the majority of our business retail now. Uh-huh. So you have a instant number at the end of the day, and you have an instant number at the end of the month and at the end of the year. <laughs> um, and so it's hard to, so, so there'll be days that are very great. There's be days that we do great. We have five new wine club members, and then there's other days that are, that are so-so. So I've always thought to myself, you can't let the highs get too high, you can't let the lows, you have to look at the long term. And you and it's hard to do that, it, and and it's hard to do it, especially when I first came out of college. I wanted there to be, you know, instant success or instant gratification, and and this business, no, it's no, it, it's very difficult to, um, you you have to be patient, and you have to, you know, be focused. But I know that there's, you know an unbelievable 2006 Tempranillo in there that I just can't wait to sell, but I'm not going to see it for two years, you know? And it's just one of those things where, um, it's, it's, you just have to, you just have to just be, go with the flow, you know, there's going to be wines out there and everything. But in terms of disappointments, I mean, there'll be days, there'll be, there'll be three or four things that happen in one day. In one day or one week or something that like, hey, we're on a roll. We're really selling a lot of wine. and Or maybe two weeks that we're on a roll. And then there's always going to be, I'm always like, hey, something's bad going to happen. Or something's going to set us back. And it's, it's always like we just, sometimes I feel like we can't, we just can't get over the hump. We just can't get over like, you know, we have all these great things happen and then something, you know, bad happens or something like that. And, and But that's just the nature of the game. You know, the thing is, is that so much of our business is we're not in control of because of the climate. So much of it is you're not in control of and you just have to learn to not get too excited when you see, you know, three or four days of rain in, in the end of September or yeah. things like that. So when you do have, when you do have, when it's finally bottled and you do have it all under your control, you have to make the best of it. You can't, you can't screw it up. Whether you get, when, once you get the fruit in, it's so important that you just continue. You be you're, you're you're so good at what you do at the end because there's so much of it is is you don't have control over it. So what you have control over, you have to make sure that you're really good at it. Yeah. So what percent you know? is in the vineyard, and what percent you know vineyard climate and all that, and what percent is in the? Um... Uh, people ask me that all the time. Oh, I, okay. I, then, I, I, I'm thinking. That. I'm thinking. <laughs> I don't know. You can't. You just simply cannot make a great wine with with poor fruit. I mean, it all starts in the vineyard. Um, you know, I, I think you can. Uh, I think you can make a, a, a. You know, you can. You can certainly improve. You, know, you can certainly make a. You know, do as best you can. But the fruit's got to be good in the beginning. Yeah. And then even in that, you know, here here you get bad fruit and you can't make a good wine. 
you get good fruiting, you can still make a bad wine. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. you still have to be, it's still one of those, one of those things where, yeah, it's, you know, I, I'm not, I don't, you know, when we have a really good wine coming down, the, you know, when you, when you know it's, you know, it's in the, the port was one of them, you knew it's good. And it's just like, I don't really literally feel good until it's in the bottle. And it's in the and it, and it something could happen. You know, yeah, well, and it, you know, and it's stable, and nothing's going to happen. But still, you know, at the very end, you're like, okay, we're bottling. And I get excited. Yeah. And then John puts it in his, and he gets excited because he's done, and I get excited because I get it. Uh-huh. So it's so we're on totally opposite ends. You know, he's in production, I'm in sales. So once he, once he's done, he puts it in that warehouse. He's done with that wine. Yeah. He doesn't have to think about it anymore. And then, of course, then it becomes my responsibility. I got to figure out how to sell this. <laughs> that one's gonna be easy to sell, but you know. But yeah, it's it's interesting how that works. How John and I, because and it marks the middle, because he's kind of the vineyard and vineyard and winery too. So he has, but I have. You know, we'll have, and it's great. Three of us, we go down there, we try the wines every two or three weeks. We stand around, spit on the floor, <laughs> spit in the drain, talk about the wines, and um, you know, it. You know, there'll be the three-way conversation. This is good. I'd like to see this together. You know, but what are we going to call it? Well, we'll call it Claret. Well, how much are we going to make? You know, 800 cases. And then they'll look at me. Do you think we can sell 800 cases? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, so there's this three-way conversation. Well, and I'll have the, you know, all the numbers. Well, last year we sold, you know, 600. I think maybe we can do more. You know, this is really good. We have to get it out quicker, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's a full, and it's, it's, you know, at the end of the day, you, get, you just hash everything out. Yeah. You just you just go through every wine and you try through the wines and you get excited and of course we get excited. I'll start doing the numbers on my like, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta do this again, you know. So, um, yeah. and and you know you have you, you you we we generally don't have problem wines and boy we don't have very many problem wines now. You know whether the, you know sometimes there are problem wines in the vineyard in the winery, but even with that there's been less and less of them. And then once we've uh, just our sales wines. I mean, I remember having two or three wines where we're like, okay, we really need to really push this wine. We need to lower the price. Not anymore. Uh-huh. We don't have to go to our distributor and say, this is our wines. Now we go to our distributor and say, you know, here are the wines. They're great wines. You know, you're really under no obligation to <laughs> sell them. Yeah. But I want them to be available to everyone because when that when that one restaurant says, "Hey, I saw your wine written up somewhere. They want to get it. They can get it." Yeah. You know, it's easy for them to get. Yeah. I want our wines accessible, and that's all about us. We we we're very. I want our wines to be accessible to everybody. I'm not into exclusivity. Our wine club is is generally set up to be um, somewhat entry level, but definitely more. Um, we we do get good discounts on case prices, good dis- discounts on bottle prices. But if something comes up, that's uh, not as you know. We have a, uh, like the you know the port's a good example. A thousand bottles of port. Um, we're not going to be exclusive. We're just going to get them a better deal. Uh-huh. I don't like the exclusivity. We're 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 kind of a, I don't know, kind of a populist winery in a way. Yeah. Where we want to have as many people. people. Yeah, we want to have as many people try our wines as possible. Yeah. And enjoy them. And if you want to join the wine club, fine. You know, we've been around long enough to where we don't. You know, the wine club's important, and I like it. And it's a great way to just walk in the door, have free tasting, and get 20% on cases. But I don't want the people outside the wine club to be shut out. Yeah. Because we've been here such a long time. We have a tremendous amount of people that aren't. We have more people that are, 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 that are not in the wine club that buy wine than are in the wine club. Yeah. So I don't want to shut them out. So sometimes I'll actually tell people, don't, don't be in the wine club because you only like this, this wine and this wine, and I'll just take care.